guest panelists or speakers. And then um, Kat Nass will be doing this. Hello. <laughs> Southern Missionary Baptist, and so there's a lot of different layers on top 
of that, and that's where I got my identity from. That's where I got my drag character from. Her name is Beulah Land, and she's inspired by my uh, really strong-willed family uh, back home, uh, where I get a lot of my spiritual energy from. Um, I, I want to be respectful, and I want to pay homage to them, but at the same time, I kind of want to show that you can be queer, you can be Southern, and those are not mutually exclusive. You can be, you can want a family and still be queer. Um, I guess I come from a long line of drag family. Um, if any of you are familiar with RuPaul's Drag Race, Eureka O'Hara is my drag grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, above her is Jacqueline St. James, who gave birth to like literally the entire western half of the state of, of drag queens. Um, <laughs> a legendary entertainer based out of Johnson City, Tennessee. Um, and then my mother is uh, Ida Carolina, so I've got a lot of really strong powerhouses of southern mountain drag queens in the area. So that's how that kind of pulled together and shaped who I am today. Um, I often put the question, being an artist can get insulated and isolated mm -hmm. existence at times. Um, wondering, do you think your queer identity in the South further encourage you to be an artist or dissuaded you? And it's interesting because I came here, I moved to Asheville in 1999 for the job to teach at UNCA. And all of a sudden, I'm a, I'm a New York Jew in the South, which kind of made me feel more Jewish because I'm, you know, and, and especially back then, I mean, I think there's a lot more Jews today than there were 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I actually embraced my Jewishness, but I also embraced my queerness more so. And I think Asheville is a pretty queer-friendly place. Um, UNCA had a, has a queer studies conference every other year, and I was I've been involved with it every year, every time I've been, you know, every other year I've worked <laughs> on it. I organized. I also um, I'm a writer. Uh, I I actually have an undergraduate degree in photography, but I. Um, I write now and I teach writing, but I also teach a class called Queer Arts, Queer Activism, which I made up just for my love. It's an arts and ideas class that I just made this up. And I taught it four times, I'm teaching it for the fifth time in the fall. And I just think it's interesting to teach young people, young college students who are still figuring out their identities and we're looking at all kinds of photographers and dancers, queer, you know, very queer or very not queer. I mean, you talk about and when Dickinson the first day, Oscar Wilde. Um, but I think that just exposing them to queer art and and, and, and you know looking at ACT UP and the, and the artists and the art that, that ACT UP um, activists use and how that actually did further social change. Um, and it's amazing that these students never knew about this stuff. They're like, how come I didn't learn about this stuff? They're like, I don't know anything about queer history. <laughs> They just never heard about it in school. Um, and at the, the last, um, for the final project, I have students um, make their own piece of art inspired by at least two of the artists we looked at and for the artist statement. And it's just so amazing that they're so supportive of each other. They're like, oh, I couldn't believe I did this work. They, you know, some of them have been artists, but COVID just shut them down. They, and, um, and did they create these arts? And I think that it's so, so important for us to be represented, but also to, um, when we see other people represented, we can feel better about ourselves. I mean, I also came out in the 80s. I came out in New York, and even though New York is very liberal, it's also a time when people were being gay bashed, um, or people you know, with AIDS, and you know, just a lot of homophobia. So it wasn't that easy for me, but I also realized it's not easy for a lot of Southern kids coming from very conservative families. And it's an honor for me to see the blossoming of students because that kind of is healing for me. So I never had that opportunity when I was that age. So I'll leave it there. Um, hey everyone, my name is Jenny now, or Gigi. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because I don't consider myself an artist. Um, I think I more consider myself an organizer. Uh, I think I consider myself more um, a human, like just a person who just somehow found love with people who are the same organs as myself. I'm a cisgendered woman, and <laughs> um, I think the question, these questions are extremely interesting because, like, one of them that uh, 
it out to me was what made you feel safe? And I think we could have a great conversation about safety in the South. Um, and I think we're here talking about queerness, um, but I think my queerness isn't necessarily just seen, right? I don't, you can't, I don't just walk and it's like, well, she's gay. Like, not necessarily. And so I think safety is an interesting conversation when we're talking about the identity of queerness and, and what it looks like. And I think it could be a privilege that I'm a cis woman and I identify in that way. Um, but I think when we talk about I'm Latina in the South from New York, born in Colombia, and then it gets interesting, immigration. And, <laughs> and then I think that that's where, you know, and then I walk around with my black white fiance and we're like, oh yeah, like we're right, right here. <laughs> um, and I think I think that was really interesting to hear about other people and their and their connection to the word safety or braveness. And I was more curious to hear from people in the room. Mm -hmm. Who is it? How does everybody else feel about that? The older I get, the, the less safe I feel. Mm -hmm. Really? Like you just go a little more fuck it. Like the I'm here. I'm just. And I think that that you just present differently. But like as a younger person, you just are really innocent. You almost are like living to just like mm -hmm. But the older you get, the more you learn. Like you just also run out of fucks to give. So <laughs> you're a threat. So I partnered with um, an organization, a Youth Outright, that's uh, located here in Western North Carolina in Asheville. Um, and we actually like stay away from the words safe space because to determine that a space is safe negates a lot of different variables that you can't account for as a facilitator, as an adult in a room. You can take steps to make a space safer, but you can't guarantee that someone is not going to come into contact that's just the nature of our identity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'd like to challenge you all to think about safety rather than safe or unsafe, liberal or conservative, queer or straight, and more look at it as a continuum because there's risk, there's different levels of risk. I'll say I'm six foot three, I'm mm -hmm. Caucasian, and I have male privilege because I don't pass as a woman. But, uh, well, <laughs> Maybe any day, any day but today. I feel, I'm feeling this great. <laughs> um, but I like it, it, it's kind of a loaded question to say, you know, do you feel safe? Because I feel safe with my friends. I don't know if I feel safe to wear exactly what I want to wear or to say exactly what I want to say. But there are ways that I can control for those risks. I live in Burnsville, and I went to get milkshakes today. And McDonald's didn't have milkshakes. So I was like, ooh, I'm gonna go to one of the local places to get a milkshake for you know, my family. And they go over there, and they have the big, you know, um, oh, what's it? The the police, the like. Blue Lives Matter? Yeah, yeah, Blue Lives Matter flag. And I was like, I went to this place when COVID first started and everything, and nobody was wearing a mask. And now over here, they've like, got this big blue and black. I'm like, you know, I don't feel safe. I'm not going in there. So I'm going to go someplace else. Yeah. Are you an artist, really? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel safe in your art? Do you, do you find that you use art as a, hmm? a way to yeah. express queerness or to be who you are? Yeah, I feel like art is a space where you can say anything, anything can happen, and it doesn't really even have to be about you. Like, my art is not always about me. It's not about my ego self. It's right. just a commentary about the larger self. So, yeah, those those boundaries don't exist in art to me. I went to Asheville two and a half years ago from New York. And so it's fun to be in this York. New York. <laughs> so it's all good morning. Yeah. But um, so I've actually really struggled to find any identifiable queerness 
in, in this city, one that is um, <laughs> reliable, relatable, visible. Um, I really, the first place that I really saw anything was that emote, which is a store on, on West Haywood that is a queer used clothing store and it's an art store. They carry some of the magazines that I wrote. But as an artist, I came here looking for a certain kind of art and a certain kind of um, political statement and message for, for artists with a political statement or something that they're saying about anything, um, and I have yet to find it. And this is the first time where I'm in a room filled with queer people and we're talking about something that is meaningful. And that could be my own limited um, vantage point. Um, that's just my experience. And thank you all that are here. I want to say that. Um, that's my picture over there, the second one from the right. Um, and slumped <laughs> over a marble or a cement um, post. That was taken in, in Naples, uh, in southern Italy. And I was there shooting a documentary um, called Summer Within, which is about my search for belonging <clears throat> through my queer Italian American identity. And so, in the process of making this film, I went to Italy, where my grandmother was from, and I discovered this ancient transgender tradition called the Feminieri. And so that's what the film is about. Um, we talk about, you know, when we're talking about safety, um, I, I feel like when queer people get together or people of a certain identity get together, it can, we can sometimes get lost in the identity politics of it all. Like, oh, we're all queer, and so that means we're suddenly in this utopia. And the reality is, for me, that I become, I like, expect to be in an unsafe situation, not to say that that means that I'm going to be attacked in some way, but sometimes like a false sense of safety can actually create more damage or, or pain interpersonally, you know? You're more likely, and this is getting kind of dark, but I'm just <laughs> you're more likely to be murdered by someone that you know, by your lover, you know, than a stranger. And so, yes, in some ways, like, especially people that look like me, the way that I'm dressed, like, definitely I'm a target for all kinds of violence. But I know when I'm doing this, I'm taking that risk. Whereas in more personal and interpersonal relationships, I'm not always aware that I'm taking that risk. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a fundamental like perspective that I bring into my art because while I use my gender and my ethnicity to examine my life and the world, I don't only do that. Mm -hmm. I look at more human, like, fundamental human questions, and I use gender and sexuality and ethnicity to, like, understand them more. Um, so belonging mm -hmm. and intimacy and identity, those are my those are my big ones. And I look forward to really talking with each of you more one on one. Thanks again for doing this, Star. Um, really okay. beautiful space. Yes. I wanted to piggyback off something you said really quickly before the next question, but it's very interesting. I think there are a lot of, I, I've been here 18 years, born um, in Philadelphia, raised in California, here 18 years. And I really believe that there are a lot of us queer artists that have a lot, there's a lot of political and social activism and protest and really raw, um, real art that I don't see either 
And what I, I'm wondering is if, you know, this is such a tourist, there's a lot of money coming in, and there's tourists, and there's so much pretty art, you know? And I want to know, like, how can we get our pieces out there that are, that are real? Mm -hmm. The weird tightrope with being politically correct and trying to address the raw feelings that you have with all these different issues, like with reproductive rights and with like the houseless population, and you know just uh, being queer and safe in this place that's supposed to be a safe space, but realizing like that's non-existent, and also like I don't. Right now, a term doesn't come to mind aside from cancel culture, but like even within like the queer community, you know, I mean, like what can you say, what can't you say, and not only to be canceled out by this community that means so much to me, much less this broader community of naturals and people visiting. It's definitely a weird tightrope. And then when you're applying for grants and whatnot, there's also that tightrope of what you can do and what you can't do, what can be permanent, what can be just for one day, and it's incredibly maddening. But um, yeah, I, I don't have a solution for that, but uh, just trying to find different calls for our, for public art and just seeing where you can, can fit in that conversation. I, I make a lot of donies. A lot of vaginas, all of us, and uh, there are a lot of mixed media. And I sent them in, and they said they can't take explicit genitalia art because children can come into the store. Well, so what? And then and I'm like, they're all shiny ass stuff.
does it feel to be like the subject and to be the person to like, you know, I think each of you were able to sort of uh, pick the way you wanted to be photographed and I know when you were doing the um, oral archives that you're able to like say what you want to say about your lives. How does that sort of visibility matter? Does more of that have to happen? Um, I, I did interviewed by the archive twice, and I've conducted a couple of interviews myself. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to like, learn about the history of like, oral history. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but, like, having people take, it, like, take control of their own stories and say their own experiences. Um, there's a, a familiar adage that uh, history is written by the winners. Whereas in oral history, everyone has a say at the table. Um, and just seeing how amazing it is to hear all of these different perspectives come together in kind of a patchwork quilt of the WNC LGBTQIA plus archive, um, it kind of rem it reminds me of not only like growing up in the mountains where my mom would quilt, but also um, kind of harkens back to um, the AIDS quilts uh, of the 80s and 90s. Um, that sort of patchwork design of having everyone say exactly what they want to say kind of goes back into the story of expressing yourself of how you really feel. Talking about some of the pictures, our picture is called, and I think you called it, it was Eve and Eve, and I guess that was super awesome, and um, Anna and I had to, actually we had pictures that were, we were naked almost, mm -hmm. uh, and covered with like flowers, mm -hmm. um, which is not shown, just because we do, and we, you know, we work and gotta do other, you know, we don't have people necessarily we want people but it's to get naked, but you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere. Um, <laughs> but it was interesting because we were talking about how to do it, and you were like, you want to be naked, but, you know, oh yeah, well, we had to buy a house, and I think that was a big deal for both of us to uh, be, like, first gen, yeah, we're like, why not? Like, it was in our backyard, and no one, like, we're naked in our backyard, then it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the story we want to tell. <laughs> and I think it, it comes with what you're saying. It's so interesting because we have this, like, dissonance <laughs> with our bodies. And, like, talking about, you know, vulvas and even, like, the sexuality and the context, and so much of it has to do with education. And we could have that conversation of education and how. That, you know, North Carolina is an abstinence-based education mm -hmm. model. They use abstinence-based mm -hmm. in their education model. It's always been mm -hmm. more about how we all that. Um, and I think talking, doing the Western North Carolina, um, doing the interview, and we got to do the interview together, I think it was interesting because I think more of my identity comes from being immigrant, Colombian, and my identity isn't so tied with queerness. And I think this is on purpose and it's because the queer community is a very white community and a very a clicky community. And to be a part of that community, like, yeah, like you could call somebody their own pronouns and even if you're queer, they're like, well, we are canceled. And <laughs> you know, that that's something to talk about the community. And so it's interesting, even when we talk about safety, like I don't feel safe in queer communities because I feel like those are the most judgmental communities that I've ever been or participated in. Yeah. Speak on it. Speak on it. Yeah. So I think it was a beautiful opportunity for me and Anna to like even talk about coming out and and that even had happened. I think when we were interviewed, I think that came out like months before. Mm -hmm. And that's because I was born in Colombia and I'm Catholic and queerness in Colombia will and can get you my surprise. It's just a happy story. My whole family was like, that's great, you know? My grandma was like, to me, that's the one what's happened though, for years. And I'm like, are you serious? That's how you're from Cuba? Dang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my dad's like, I have another daughter. And I was like, what? <laughs>
the I'm the director for Slocum Galleries, and um, it's under EPSU. And our art department actually have three queer faculty out of 14. So that's a pretty good for her. We're one of the most inclusive departments in, in the, the college we see, even in the university. Um, I'm an advisable person and a possible parent of our LGBT kids. Um, and I have, as a curator and an artist, I have always tried to promote disability and self-representation for um, minority groups and, and, and group, diverse groups. Um, a few years ago, we had an LGBT exhibition and I uh, organized a panel. And so we had the artist whose work was the visualization that is inspired by letters of youth who have killed themselves. Mm -hmm. oh, so they were a very tragic um, experience and, and he tried to memorialize them through his art. And we had a panel. I actually um, invited the uh, Key Flag, the Tri Cities um, uh, Pride Center. We had some counselors and students. And one of the persons that I included specifically was a pastor. I tried to look for a church who was very um, uh, friendly and allied to the LGBT community because I felt like our students were in the Bible Belt. And I wanted to let our students know that there are communities or there are religious groups that are willing and happy to celebrate their identity and, and, and welcome them as part of it. So that was an effort that, that we really tried to um, incorporate in that programming. And I normally am good for the university, so that was one of my first calls from the university administration, whether I got state funding for that exhibition. Because I did get um, a grant, I, I, my programming is uh, mostly um, grant funded. And I was very proud and, and I tried to explain it to the university and the university was very supportive of us explaining it to the representative, the congressman's office who got a call from a constituent whether we got state funding or not. And I said, well, for this exhibition, we did not, but if we did, that doesn't matter. It's legal, we are not doing anything wrong, and we are going to do it again. And after that, we had another, other LGBT shows that I got in trouble again. But, <laughs> but I feel like I'm doing my job. But it, I think it's interesting. I mean, I really, I commend you, because I think that uh, Carlotta's had to explain uh, her position and your art department's position to uh, the Arts Council of Tennessee. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's like, that's a little, for me, and, you know, I'm not part of the LGBTQI community. I have a non binary child, but I think for, for even today, for that to be an issue, like, we'll see what happens to this exhibit, right? For the exhibit that we're having, I'm actually inviting one of our, um, Com commissioners as guest of honor because that's part of my uh, kind of agenda to like if, if we can use art as agency and, 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 and have people more ally and, and people who can actually also do something in the policy making so she's not clear but she's uh, uh, an ally so I think it's important that we really, as, as a cisgender person, I am using my privilege and, and my position as a curator or a gallery director to help with the visibility. And for artists, I think you have not just the identity, but the ability to bridge the issue of the community to the wider social structure. And, and I feel like the self-representation, that's why I was very supportive of this um, exhibition. By the way, our monthly rent is $1,600. Oh my gosh. That's but we're not charging anything, it's free. We're, we're supporting the exhibition for free. We printed the catalogs for free mm -hmm. as part of our- beautiful catalogs that Carlotta Yeah, so we feel like, I applied for grants so that 
we can afford to have and also we try to do a lot of uh, some of the printed materials because I know not everybody can attend the exhibition so that printed material can, can go to and, and I really admire um, STARS app because yeah. I think that is even more helpful because people yeah. will have more yeah. access Please download it on your phones. It's pretty yeah, yeah. You'll see Eula. Brand ambassador. This skin I'm in. This skin I'm in. That's the movie app. Yeah. It's a title of the show. It's easier. It's got a lot of advocacy and volunteering, and it's got a lot of information about the campaign for Southern Equality and Southern Equality Studios, and Blue Pride, and ways to donate, ways to volunteer, ways to get involved. So, yeah. That's how you make spaces safer. Yeah. Is that kind of work? So thank you, Star. And last one, last advice for artists. Find curators or museums or galleries that have possibly exhibited some diversity shows in the past and propose. You'll never know who will say yes. And, and even if they're unsolicited, they might not accept your proposal immediately, but they, they might think of you for another show. They might think of you and, and curate a show for you or for the community. It's very important that you have to reach out. We, because we have to create the opportunities. The opportunity will not come to us. We have to create it and just grab it by the wall. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> whatever, sorry. But, uh, I know what I know. I'm like, not my first language, but um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's very important that um, you really try to kind of group like the the, the solidarity. It, there, there there is power in in, in, in a group, and, and the voice will be heard a little bit more if we group together and speak up together. And so create those opportunities. Like this one, Star was interested in possibly touring this. So we're actually, uh, we want to invite the artist if, you're, if it's okay with you. We're traveling the show after Tipton, or at the same time as Tipton, to Southwest Virginia, like the heart of Appalachia. We're bringing this to our, you know, all our kids. And because and, um, I think it's very important for them to. to, to Which to is very exciting. Yeah. Thank you for allowing for yeah, your work will your work is going to move on and hopefully we'll send it other places. So that's fine. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Where did both of us
something interesting about saying that is that sometimes it's fucking exhausting. Yeah. Well, because we're exhausted. Like, uh, it's a constant. And as I'm sure as a black man, as being Latina, like, I'm, I'm already having to go outside making sure that, you know, they're not telling me to go back to my country or something stupid and, you know, dumb. Or, so, you know, sometimes we're just exhausted. It's like, Every day, there's something new that we, as BIPOC people, have to fight, and, and, and it's like our identity, it's our queerness, it's our, it's like God fucking damn, like, can I just survive? Can I just be happy? It's always a constant need to to push and to push and to push, and that is so crushing. It's, it's exhausting. It's beautiful and liberating in this world that we want to create to be, you know, for liberation in itself, and it's exhausting. Yeah, that's like I just wanted to say that. A conversation that I had with one of our roommates where we were talking about, um, like what we were talking about earlier, safety and the visibility of specifically trans people. And so I asked him, like, well, what do you suggest? And he said, well, they should just keep walking out and being who they are. And I was like, mm-hmm. yes. That's a privilege thing to say. That's a privilege thing to say because, like, why are you putting the onus upon the people that are already doing the work? Why don't you? Have that work? Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, why? Why are you like deflecting the work? Like, why? I don't know. I don't know. And like you said, like as black people, I feel like it's just exhausting. And I, I think, yeah, I think one of the things that I always talk about when I give my Asheville narrative is like, I moved from New York and I lived in queer ghetto. All of my friends were queer. Every one of my friends is. Like 10 years of my age, everyone was an artist and everyone was queer, most born male. Like, Did you live in Brooklyn? I lived in. Was <laughs> <laughs> rich. I did. <laughs> Pretty much straight, you know, like casual <laughs> questioning. <laughs> and that to here, work. right here, Pan Polly Parker. Oh my god! <laughs> Peter But the learning curve for me is actually being in community with straight people. Uh, and be like, oh, okay, we're, we're not together because we share any real identity. We're together for some other reason. And so, like, a part of what I think Ripper is saying and that I've also experienced is we're ideas for people until they know us. Yes. You know? Mm-hmm. And, and I think what we can offer is allowing
they don't, they may not consciously realize it, but it's because, like, when I'm looking at a man, I'm seeing, like, your beauty. Like, when you really love someone, you bring out the best in them. And I'm genuinely, like, looking at your beauty and, like, taking all of that in and, like, holding your face. So, like, it's easy to lean in. But they don't understand the context of, like, the relationship that the, that it's in, you know? And the cost to do. Yeah, like, the cost to me, the, the ratio of, like, give and take, they, it's just not, it's mm -hmm. not understood. So, that's a layer. That's work. Gina and Anna did great advocacy work in the community in several different areas. So, thank you both. What do you do?
questions she could tell them. So it literally made them think of like, let's have a conversation about that. Not as, but like to like expand the brain, which also could be exhausting and depends on your capacity. And I do it every day. <laughs> you know, and consent and all of that is real. So I love that. That's great. That's great. Um, you all have made a beautiful evening for me. So I really thank everybody who's here for everybody that said everything that they've said. And you all have made my life richer. My new friends here, you really have. Thank you. Um, I think we can wrap it up unless anybody has anything else to say and feel free to hang out and you know, sort of get to know each other more personally. Thank you. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing who you are.